Welcome back to the Gymnasio Podcast. I'm your host this time, Michael Hughes, here with CJ Kobliska as we dive into one of, I think, our favorite topics as a facility, something we put so much time and energy into because it is, as any gym owner, any gym um, leader, any trainer would say, it is their bread and butter. It's their product. It's their program. It's what their clients eat. It's what their clients breathe, smell, and do. And it's what we love so much to talk about. And we have I don't think we've actually really dove into this topic of pure programming. We've kind of spoke our methodologies and our practices and what we understand as movement, but how does it all come together? So we like to think that our product, you know, if you go to gymnasium, like you go to any other restaurant, what kind of food do you serve? Is it American? Is it a fusion? You know, is it, uh, you know, Japanese kind of cuisine? Well, we say we serve vitality and sustainability for the rest of your life. That's what we do. And if you want to come to Jermazo and perceive that kind of goal for your life, God, you're in the right spot. Does it mean that we can't do some heavy lifting? Does it mean we can't do some crazy flow stuff that makes uh, people kind of smile and say, what the heck are you doing? Oh, yes, we definitely can. But that's our bread and butter is this idea that we want to train someone for the rest of their life. So we have to produce a product that enables that to happen. I cannot think of a better person to speak about this topic than the man who created it himself. CJ, can you just kind of unpack for everyone listening, what do we mean by those phrases when we say that's Jim Nazo's product, is the programming that reaches this vitality state, this sustainability state for literally any individual that can come through these doors? We've got such a wide range of people that come through our doors at Jim Nazo. Um, True. I mean, different demographics, different lifestyles, uh, some people in their 20s and 30s that are just wanting to get after it and build physique, and people in their 60s, 70s, 80s that are going, I just want to be able to take care of myself uh, into my older age. Um, so when you talk about sustainable vitality, um, these, these two terms, sustainable being something that we can do over time, can do consistently and keep showing up for. Uh, and be able to sustain and maintain the level of ability uh, or effort or intensity uh, or just focus on what we're doing. And the vitality being the energy which comes off or comes from uh, that challenge, that program. That's something that you do consistently. Um, so there's a lot to consider when, we, when we're going into programming, especially when I first started uh, to where I am now, uh, you know, starting out with just one program. We've got three levels of programming, G1, G2, G3. Uh, starting with one program was pretty simple to focus on a demographic that was, uh, you know, let's say our middle of the middle of the road. That G two, uh, not necessarily in the the uh, intensity of the workout. G one, G two, G three, they can be all very intense, but in terms of the complexity and the the requirement in order to complete that program, it was pretty simple uh, on a one level focus because I was looking at maybe the diff- the the range of thirty to. 50 year olds, the recreational athlete, the one that wants to, that's got kids in elementary school, middle school, uh, and high school, and wants to be able to sustain their level functioning with their kids as their kids are growing. Um, so it was a lot of just lifestyle, you know, stepping up and down boxes, lifting weights, farmers carries, mm-hmm. getting up off the ground, putting stuff overhead. And it did carry some more of the traditional mindset of training. But as you pull in a wider age range, and a wider range of ability and somebody that's never trained before and they're 60 years old, where does that, where do you start with that person if they want to do group training? And then for the person that's maybe in that G2 level, but looking for the higher intensity and wants to compete a little bit more and, and kind of find their true upper thresholds, how do we progress a workout in a sense? Um, so looking at it as a full spectrum of effort and ability, uh, we got to consider essentially what's the common themes um, that we experience in our life as it relates to movement and go from there. Yeah. And, and something I didn't mention is the level of different programs that we actually do here. And I just want to clarify that real quick, because you started talking about group, group training. So gosh, well, there's really more to this topic. We're talking about group training specifically, but we, we do one-on-one based training, which is designed for sort of that exact individual in, in front of us based upon a movement assessment. Well, everything's based upon a movement assessment for the most part. Then we have semi-private training, which is also one-on-one based training, but it's done in a group-based uh, group, a very small group of four athletes to one coach. And so we have to man- manage that and still construct that. And you still program for that too, as well as our semi-private team. 
Um, and then there's the group training. And you mentioned G1, G2, G3. Now, for those listening, G1 is essentially our entry-level program. G2 is our mid-based program. <clears throat> CG will get into more, into more of this. G3 is our higher base program. In, in our facility, they're run as individually based programs. But for, for, for you listening, this could certainly be one group, and you just co- um, kind of hone your eye to in the individual people in that one group. So I just want to make that kind of very, very clear of when, when we're talking about our programming, we put it into buckets, you know, but in reality, you can, you can sparse out as much as you want. So I just wanted to make that point. Yeah, I want to talk on that a little bit too, just kind of paint a picture of what our ecosystem looks like for those that are in it and see a bigger picture and those who haven't experienced gymnasio at all. And if you, if you think about it like as a, a continuum, there's, there's a couple of different ways to look at this, but a continuum of uh, health minus, health zero and health plus like we've talked about in the past. Somebody who's maybe injured or uh, recovering from an injury or maybe hasn't trained ever and they're, they're undertrained and they just want to start out. We consider that maybe a health minus and not saying to a negative thing, but just kind of classify as where is, are they at in the spectrum? We got to build mm-hmm. them in to our ecosystem of actual programs. So we got to know where that person is on that health scale, health zero being, Hey, I've maybe done some training here and there. I don't really have any injuries, but I haven't really been working towards anything. And the health plus thinking more performance based, uh, not necessarily sport, but just performing in life. Exactly. That's the game yeah. of life. Yeah, right? and, and when I think about our athletes, we're, they're in the sport of life. We might have athletes that are playing rec sports and stuff on the field and on the courts and whatnot, but think about every single person, every single athlete is also in the sport of life, and mm-hmm. we need to make them, help them become more functional in that sense. So in terms of our actual ecosystem of our programs, like Michael had said, we have the, the one-on-one and semi-private, and then the G1 and G2 and G3, and a couple other mix of classes in there for restoration, but in a general sense, that's our framework. So if you look at it in the somebody coming in brand new, ideally, if somebody's looking at progressing into a route to G3, into the higher performance stuff, they might come in as a one-on-one, work in a semi-private, get familiar with the lingo and the movements that we do, because it is very different than just traditional based or just a methodology. It's a mix of methodologies. Mm-hmm. That's what we call it in the mix when you're working out here. Uh, working from that one-on-one to I semi-private like to, one, to G1 to G2 to G3. That being said, somebody might come in and say, I don't necessarily want to do G3 or G2. I just want to have a good workout. Right. They might find themselves staying in a one-on-one, or they might find themselves staying in a G1 or a G2, uh, or even that semi-private route. So the ecosystem isn't necessarily that you have to go through it in every single program and build to something, but kind of find where your home base is. Find where you can sustain your level of functioning mm-hmm. and then build from there. And that's where that vitality comes in. Because you can sustain something and kind of just live on a single scale, but if it's not feeding the vitality, is it actually? Are you actually sustaining right. something, or are you slowly withering away in your programming? Right. Yeah, You've degrading something. something. And even if you're pushing too hard, you're growing, but you're st- you could still be kind of tearing away at the body. And this, it's I would say so. For like professional athletes, that's not a sustainable sport because you cannot do that for the rest of your life. Right at that level. You know, so it's kind of this interesting, fa- you know, like, wow, that trainer or a YouTube video, man, that guy's crushing it. His training program is incredible. And it is incredible. But is that sustainable? Now, that, that, that trainer may say, of course it's not su- sustainable. You know, we got to play the Super Bowl. We got to, you know, we got to push as hard as we possibly can. But I think we still idolize that training. Totally. I do too. And I get stuck in it. You know, I think we all do, especially if you have that athletic mindset, that competitive mindset, you want to push, but there's with that push, with that competition and with that higher, higher level of intensity on something that looks like a really badass program, how sustainable is it really? And when we're talking about sustainability, what I'm really considering is when I'm 60, when I'm 70, when I'm 80, when I'm 90, when I'm 110, Michael, Mm. what do I want the ability to do? I look forward to working out with you. I I tell everybody, I'm like, I'm learning so much from the people that are are much older than I am because of what they've done in their life or have not done and where they are now. And uh, there are so many different programs out there. I'm not saying this is the best program, but when we're talking about sustainable vitality and something that you can do across multiple demographics and forever, like you build lifetime clients as a coach, and also, as an athlete or as a client, you're building some kind of program that you can sustainably do and show up to and look forward to. Not every day is going to be like sunshine and rainbows and goes, I love working out. But on those programs that are higher intensity and you feel broken down from, 
I sense that there's less encouragement internally going into wanting to show up to that program and then slowly switch to drop off. And so you see these six to eight week, 10, 12 week protocols uh, that are they're slowly progressive, and then all of a sudden you hit the end of it, and it's like, hey, what's the next program? Yeah. Uh, we do something different. We look at it as a, as a year long. There's no off season for life. Literally. You are in season Always. if you're living. Yeah. Let's do something that helps to feed your in seasonness. And so we can, we'll dive into more of the programming and what that actual framework looks, looks like as a, as a group training. But I think we still need to kind of define what it is to us that we want to keep doing uh, and keep training for. Like what's the, what's the intention behind the training? Uh Because I think a lot of us in our twenties and thirties, the intent is to look good Mm -hmm. and to feel good. And I think that's across many programs. And I think it's a great intent. We all want to look good naked, Um, but we also want to feel good naked. We also want to feel good just when we're moving in life and hiking around or Mm -hmm. we're at the grocery store and getting out of our car and looking to back up into our car. You know, these little things that we, start to recognize as we age and I'm in my thirties right now, I'm, I'm young, but I still recognize days when I wake up and go, Oh, okay. Not turning right today. But my mindset has shifted from, okay, not turning right today to, I wonder what I can do to move to unlock this. And I go and do a workout that looks like it's half ass, but I feel so good after it. And then it sets me up for another day of success, another day of success. And those discomforts that pop up here and there and we reach for something and we go, Oh, my belt, my low back, I'm getting older. Or oh, I slept wrong, or like we find all these like external excuses, but really it comes down to what are we actually doing for our own body's program. And when I say program, it's a true program, just like a TV program. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a, a start, it's a middle, program. and end. Yes, yeah. yes, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And with this program, it's not there is no necessary end. It's where are you at on your journey, yeah. and let's meet you where you are today. Yeah. And for myself, having that conversation of, I've got a. Pro, a program dialed in and I'm going to follow it. But today I'm going to make a little modification. I'm going to make a little tweak and I don't down myself on it or, or get feel guilted or shamed from it. It's more of, wow, I'm having an honest conversation with my body today. And some days I push too hard and I'm honest and say, we're going to take it a little easier. And I think there's, there's the mindset of I pushed hard and I hurt. I need to push harder. I need to push harder. And that mentality, I think, will get you very far in pushing harder and high intensity. But mm-hmm. how sustainable is that? Mm-hmm. I think about this, like this, this TV sit- sitcom. <coughs> <coughs> yeah, both of us. Yeah, yeah. A lot to say here. <laughs> <laughs> so I think about this, this, like TV sitcom, you know, and like every single show is a to be continued. You know, I said end the the workout ends, but it's still to be continued. And there's still that part in in, in that sitcom where people will just ad lib and just go off the cuff because the script said this, but the moment said that. And I remember as being an early trainer, and I, I I'm kind of excited to say this. Like I, I've been doing this job for 20 years now. Like I hit the 20 year mark, and I'm 40 years old. It's like wow, I've been doing this half of my life, and I've also turning 40 this year, it's like, I realize when I'm out of training, out of the sport of life, getting up out of the couch sometimes doesn't feel as energetic. Hmm. And I'm like, whoa, that was a little bit harder. And this is after two kids and going through COVID. It's like, wait, wait a minute. Like that was my, like, I don't care how good I look naked. If it's hard to get up out of, I mean, not hard, but you know, you feel that like that was, shouldn't have been that challenging. Anyways, tangent. So it's always in this, in this constant, concept of as I was a trainer, I realized like I knew a workout to produce because the client showed up. I have to give them something to do. And so I just want to be like very clear. Writing a workout is different than writing a program. And what we mean by that is like we're talking about a series of different workouts that produce, as you said so awesomely, an intentional outcome, a goal that is, well, not so simple. It's multifaceted and multidimensional. Right. Uh, so I think we, should, we can dive into that a bit more of like, what, is a, what does a program look like versus a workout? And I think many trainers can relate to this of, it's, we're just playing catch up. And like, I have enough of an exercise library in my head, mm-hmm. enough videos I've watched and 
things I've read and things I've tried and explored. Uh, you get, as an ex, a movement explorer, as a as a trainer, if you explore movement, you have a lot of bandwidth to just be like, I could just go off the cuff. Of course. But right. how sustainable is that too? You're like, man, I'm just playing catch up all the time. At least personally, that's what I felt like when I was doing my own workouts before Gymnazo, before I actually got into programming was just show up to the gym and what feel, what I feel like today. And that was a beautiful experience too in itself because I went in with no real plan. You know, I knew there's things to do and I might hit some of the machines and get some little muscle pump. And then I go to the studio and go grab a Bozu and a med ball and figure out what to do. And it was like, it was setting, it was probably in my mind for when I started at Gymnazo to be like, holy shit, Pandora's boxers opened up and I have now infinite potential of what I could do. Now I have no idea what to actually do because there's so many options. Yeah. And so coming to Gymnazo's framework initially, it was set up as a quarter system. And so the, the <clears throat> workouts, let's say for a G2 level, the level two, you had, uh, four weeks of individual workouts. Every day was different, Monday through Friday of week one and week two and week three and week four. So if you think about five days a week, Monday through Friday training, that's 20 different workouts that overall turn into a one month long program mm -hmm. that then is repeated for two more months. So you really only do the same workout three times. And I thought that was so fascinating. Uh, I didn't think too much about it, but it was more like, wow, there's just, there's, where does this end? is this sustainable? Are you going to run out of moves to do? And the answer was absolutely not. Mm. If you run out of moves, that's on you. Like you, you gotta, you gotta go explore some stuff and figure out a new framework or try new methodology and integrate it. Right. And so it was cool coming to Gymnazo and, and seeing the great institutes, AFS and 3d biomechanics implemented in a fitness setting. It's something that I had never seen before, except maybe like in a wrestling practice, and it was, and I was starting to kind of form my mind around, okay, there's six different drills. There's six exercises essentially. And there's a, there's a setup here because it goes every single day is already pre-programmed. We're not showing up and then just setting up a workout for the day. And then the next coach sets up their workout the day. It's like, no, the whole coaching staff is coaching this workout that a programmer created. And next day it's different. Next day it's different. And I got kind of put right into that off the bat of, uh, figuring out, you know, where equipment goes and what equipment do we have access to? And then coaching those workouts, what do I need to change for somebody who can't do this? What options do I have? And so then getting into and experiencing the actual program itself, it was all very sub-maximal. Like we weren't doing barbell, cleans, deadlifts, squats, front squat, like the traditional type stuff you'd see. And there's no machines either. So it was kind of like how, what mind put this together and does it, it kind of makes sense. It flows together, but why did they choose these six exercises? And so my brain was spinning and doing all this math of, you know, I know like I need to have a percentage of my max and do this amount of reps to build and do hypertrophy and do power training. It was like, no, let's, that stuff's important, but let's not make that a priority. That's for sport performance and really trying to amplify muscle growth, enhance muscle growth or speed or conditioning. It was like for one fitness component. Mm -hmm. Now that it works, it's tried and true methods. You, you know, I, I went through the certified strength and conditioning, CSCS, and I've gone through the ACSM and I've got my personal training stuff, but going through an experiential learning with your nozzle those first, that first year uh, and learning how to implement sagittal, frontal and transverse on a much deeper level. I think on the outer level, the outer layer, somebody who comes in and kind of knows the plans of motion, but hasn't gone through grand institute stuff or any of our MDMC stuff with gymnasium or any of our educational stuff. It's kind of like, yeah, you can you can separate exercises by plane, but why would you do that when we're focusing on muscles? It's like, mm -hmm. no, there's actually a deeper intent here that's starting to talk to the proprioceptors that when you're moving, your proprioceptors are firing in different ways that are going to help your muscles communicate better. Your muscles are dumb and your, your movements are the smart piece. Yeah, that's right. That's very well said. And I was like, wow, this completely shifted my awareness of why we're programming these exercises. And it's so much less focused on just the muscle growth and the speed and the, the, those fitness components and mobility and whatnot. It's more of this all encompassing sphere of potential mm -hmm. with your body in space. And let's get out of our, just this, just the small scientific mindset of X plus Y equals Z in terms of the, the rep count and the percentage of weight. And this is going to create this result. It's like, yeah, that stuff works but how can we actually influence a person's awareness and help them move better in their life? That's what I was experiencing when I was going through this program of like, 
Huh, I got different ways I can, I can I can climb these stairs. You okay over there, Hughes? <laughs> Bless you. That was a burp sneeze at the same time. Huh? <laughs> Impressive. Got to program that one. That's the intention to do that. Uh, but long story short, I, when I started stepping into the actual programming aspect of this, I didn't realize how many dimensions there were. It's infinite, and to try and sort an infinitude of options. Um, you got to have an intent. You got to have a framework. You got to have people because you might on paper have the most brilliant program that has the math and the sets and the reps and the weights that's going to lead to this amount of strength, or this amount of power, this kind of outcome. Mm-hmm. But missing out on so many other pieces, so many other dimensions of this was, okay, I got to figure out what do these people need to do in real life? They got to be able to get up the stairs and downstairs. They got to be able to lift something up an overhead bin when they're traveling. They got to be able to get down and off, up and up and down off the ground with their grandkids. They got to be able to go play rec soccer, rec soccer on a Sunday, and they've got three kids and they're sleep deprived. How aware they're going to be on that Sunday to go play? They may not be the best athlete on the field, but they're having a good fucking time. Mm-hmm. So how can I make sure that they continue to have a good time doing these things and aren't breaking themselves down to where they're like, I'm just too old to do this. Now, there's maybe some things that we're too old to do. Yes, there's a, I understand that argument. To but yeah, it's a very small argument if you really look at it. Yeah, let's, let's yeah. actually figure out what you want to do. Let's yeah. stop focusing on what you can't do. Let's mm-hmm. focus on what you can do. And so to have 300 plus people, 400 plus people to program for, not all at the same time, but to have a mix of, uh, let's say you got 20 people in a class and you got five that are in their 60s, you got 10 that are in their 40s and 50s, and another five that are in their 20s mm-hmm. that are like, you just got out of college and they're just training. This is something new. Mm-hmm. How do you serve that whole group of 20 people with the same workout? Mm-hmm. Now we don't have a one size fits all approach, but with a program, we have the ability to regress and progress it. Not in a, necessarily a bad or good way or negative and positive way, but in a let's meet this person, this individual where they are with this. What's the intent of this exercise? Mm-hmm. It's less of the intent of let's work your pecs and your quads and your glutes. It's we're working a lunge with a low reach or working a, press with a step and starting to coordinate and become more aware of these pieces. And that become became extremely fun for me because what could you fit into a quarter that's not overwhelming yeah, and not underwhelming? Yeah. And I think there's a lot of programs out there that are underwhelming, uh-huh. meaning they're boring. They work. They're tried and true. And I think there's a lot going around of like the boring workouts are the best workouts. Like, bullshit, if you're not going to do it, it's not a good program. It's not a good workout. And yeah. I think that may serve a certain demographic of people with the mindset of a of a competitive athlete that just need to get in and grind and then go. Mm-hmm. Um, but for those individuals, what we're talking about, the people that we're really serving, people might refer to as general population. I'm talking, we're talking cousins, brothers, sisters, moms, dads, grandparents. Like we're talking, these people are our family. They may not actually be our direct family, but we have somebody that we can relate to that mm-hmm. is where they are. And I want to say one thing. Go for I, it. I'm just. I know you're dying. Like, I know what you're about to say, and I want <laughs> you to di- dive into it because it's the, really the meat of this whole podcast. I've heard so many people say, you know, it's the boring workout that's that's the best workout. And again, I, from what they're saying, they are correct because it's going to get a result because we can't have randomized training because that's going to build randomized results. Whatever the body does, it gets better at, and if it gets better at random, it gets better at random. But think about think about movement patterns. Think about going through your day, and I want to challenge. I want to challenge everybody. Try to program, write down, record the movements of your day, all of them. That's a challenge. Truly, think about when you leaned, when you reached, when you leaned and reached, when you rotated, leaned and reached, when you got high, when you got low, and just think about the static positions you're in for long periods of time. That's intentionality. And then think about the lifts that we traditionally do in the industry and think how do they fit those movement patterns. And I bet you're going to find a very shocking answer. So I just I had to preface it because I, I don't know. I just want I'll share to a strategy because yeah. I think that's important. But it's hard also on ourselves, like figure out what positions we're in and when we're not necessarily set up in that mindset. Well, a trainer can think about it. An yeah. average person, it's subconscious. But yeah. I th- I'd say even for a trainer, for what worked for me was I actually you know sit at a coffee shop and watch how people move, watch mm-hmm. how people sat down, watch how people open the door, watch how people were serving the coffee, watch how they were making the coffee, watch how they were getting in, watch somebody almost trip on something and step over. Like what are those things that people are doing like in real time right now? 
and creating a six exercise program that's, that's on what they just did. <laughs> right. And I would write down those exercises and I'd trip them in as like functional life activities. And it started to help me uh, organize this program in a, in a way. And what I've been, what we've been building here and specifically these past few years is a sustainable vitality program. It's a, it's a program that you could literally do for the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. And there's enough variety in it that feels almost like you're doing something different all the time, but there's a commonality to it that you feel like you're able to gain more awareness of what you're doing as you're doing it. Yeah. So to share what you built and share yeah. where we're going with it. Totally. Like the future of this process. So let's share this past quarter or the quarter that we're currently in. Yeah. We're currently in our, you know, our third year of this program. And this is the first quarter. And how I like to organize the quarters, you know, with all these multi dimensions, I don't just go in and program exercises. It actually starts with a larger template and just me writing down uh, titles of workouts. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, really? This is yeah. what I find works for me is uh-huh. actually starting with I have four weeks of programming to do. Mm-hmm. I got Monday through Friday, week one, and week two, and week three, and week four. So I got 20 titles to come up with. Now, these titles set a stage. This is how my mind works. It might not be how your mind works, but it sets a stage for what we're going to be doing in terms of movement in those workouts so that there's this overarching theme of the entire quarter. This quarter was 3D structural skills, like being, gaining awareness of 3D space. Previous quarters have focused on different things, but it still implements these pieces. Hey, so you're starting I, with the end in mind. Yeah, this quarter, what do I want to get? I want people to feel very confident moving sagittally, moving frontally, moving transverse, mm-hmm. but not feeling so restricted in that plane, saying that I have to stay in a straight line this way, that way, that way, because mm-hmm. now we're stuck in that just one plane of motion. Mm-hmm. But how can we integrate other planes in a one plane focus motion, like a forward lunge in the sagittal plane? How can we integrate the frontal plane? You know, doing a uh, lateral overhead reach or doing a sweep, or doing a med ball throw in rotation. So how I've set up quarter one for this whole 3D structure is like, okay, week one, let's focus primarily on the sagittal, forward and back, up and down movement. In week two, let's focus more on the frontal, more side to side movement, lateral movement. Week three, more transverse focus, more rotational ability. And then week four, integrating all the SF and T's every single day. So in week one, let's, you know, if there's uh, six exercises per day, that gives you Monday, through Friday, that's five days times six. That's 30 exercises, essentially. Mm -hmm. I want half of those to be focused on sagittal. The other half is a combination of frontal and transverse. Week two, mostly frontal. 15 of those exercises are frontal, and then 15 of them are a combination of sagittal and transverse. So this kind of sets the stage of just uh, of how I want to title those weeks and theme those weeks, theme those days, so that somebody coming in for the workout goes, I don't necessarily know all the dimensions of movement and where we're going to go with it, but it looks like we're biasing something in today's workout. And now we can pay attention to that piece. We can bring some intentionality to where's my focus in my movement? How am I stepping? What direction am I going? So for this, I had really fun, a lot of fun this quarter. And where week one was sagittal focused, all the titles started with S. Week two, all the titles started with F for frontal plane. And th- th- three is T for transverse plane. And then week four was all the titles had S, F, and T in it. Now, that's kind of just a silly, fun thing that I like to do as a programmer. But it brings more of a storyline and more of a narrative to the program when mm-hmm. it's not so focused on the muscles. We're focusing on the movements and what we're able to do in space. So, for example, of title, like in, in week one of sagittal, was we had sublime strides. In that workout, we focused a lot on the stride position Mm -hmm. and moving sagittally in strides and running and locomotion. We had another one that was called uh, the sagittal surprise. It was surprising movements in the sagittal plane, things that you might not necessarily think of, but they're more powerful. And so with each of these days, they're broken down even further into those movements. And I try to bring in a complex and some simplicity to the day. So it's not overwhelming on somebody's nervous system in the, in the brain thinking about their movement, but also not so simple that they could just kind of go through the motions without thinking at all. all right. I want to pull the person in and feel engaged in the experience, feel encouraged in it and feel empowered of the education that they can get through the, the program versus just the muscle gain or the mobility aspect of the speed aspect. Let's think about how can we communicate better with our body in space and then have that carry over to real life. So with the, the SFT integration, we, we bring in a lot of SFT movements into every single quarter. 
but sometimes a quarter is maybe more focused on explosive movement or getting up off the ground. And a majority of that quarter is focused on building that aspect. Uh, next quarter, and I'm programming right now, is a lot of focus on bringing back our gymnasio roots and looking at you know our original G1, G2, G3 were, were Iro, Ethos, and Fortis. Mm -hmm. And those terms carry a lot of weight when you start to not necessarily just know the definition, but embody the definition. And Iro being, you know, we rise by lifting others. And it's a lot of partner workouts and lifting stuff up off the ground, mm. including our body. I love that. And week two being more the, the ethos, the character of movement. You know, you're building character through your movement. There's a lot of versatility and shiftiness and, and agility in it. And uh, it, the program asks the individual to bring themselves into it. Don't just do the motion, but do it for you. And there's opportunities to, to bring in some modifications to those for the individual's sport or their focus and what they want to improve. Uh, whether it be balance, whether it be running faster or jumping higher, it's kind of their, their option that week of the exercises programmed. And week three, uh, being Fortis, it's kind of like the courage, the strength, the bravery of movement. So it's a bit more toughness and grit and grind. And then week four, the fun one's going to be the week of gnosis. It's the week of knowledge of those three all put together. Ooh, I never we heard rise that by word lifting yet. others. I'm, we, I'm here the G. for the first time it's too. It's the G, baby. <laughs> <laughs> so we're bringing that in uh, next quarter, and that's our focus. So there's a lot of options on what you can fill in those workouts. And somebody who knows something other than I might bring in specific exercises to those sets for their community. But for our community, it's really about helping each other move better in our life and to feel more awareness of um, this, this body, mind, soul connection and not necessarily blaring it at them, but as you move through this program, you start to connect on your body on new levels that you may not have ever got to on your own because you never would have programmed these exercises. Yeah. Um, it's like I'm listening to a master chef, CJ, who is not just talking about beans, rice, and a tortilla. And beyond, yeah. <laughs> like, I just, this is just jumped in my head. It's talking about like the essence of the spice that went into that tortilla because it's not just flour, corn, and you know whatever the case is. It's the it's the aroma, the experience, the process of what that fish melted with that butter. With that, it's yeah. just like because when someone who enjoys food, there's just food for fuel and there's food for. Well, I don't want to use the same word as ethos, but it's there's it's for the like it's for the life that can be lived eating that food. And I really appreciate what you're saying is about this concept, like movement can just be a workout to detox yourself, de-stress yourself is what I'm trying, trying to mean, but there's essence to it. And so I yes. just appreciate that. There's an, there's, <laughs> I just, I just, I'm not to kind of, uh, clap our, our, own, our own hand here in a sense, but, uh, it's beautiful. Keep yeah, on well, going. We've got a few of our MDM series, our multidimensional movement coaches that have gone through our system gone through our certification and they're implementing these programs in their own workouts in their own their own training mm -hmm. some are going to the t monday through friday exactly as it is and again and again and again for each week and then through the quarter and when you go through it five days it's designed to be a five day a week program you can show up and do it five days a week every single week which is week out. fits into the sustainability yeah. And yeah. you obviously have to gauge your level of intensity as you go through it. And the reason we repeat it for three months is that month one is kind of a learning month. You're just taking your body through some a new cycle of movements. So you're going to have some different sorenesses and different ways your body now communicates to you what's going on from a different quarter. You might be like, wow, I thought my legs were really strong. And now all of a sudden I feel like my inner thighs are really sore. And it's like, yeah, they're strong, but we're just targeting them in a different way in a different set and different series. The ones that do those five days a week for that first month, you're like, okay, I learned the motions. Now month two, you go back to it. Recycle. Recycle. Mm -hmm. And you're like, wow, I recognize this. Remember this. And hopefully you're taking notes. I have a, like a metric sheet that it's not just what weight you did, what reps you did, but you keep notes on how you felt that day. And, and you might be like, wow, this month I was just completely out of it mentally, but I was doing the work. And I came back the second month and I'm like so in it but I don't feel as physically gritty. I feel like just mentally aligned. And so this month one, learning month two, recognition, and then month three is kind of the progression or the performance or the push. You recognize these pieces. It's the third time going through this and you go, am I going to the same weight? 
Am I going to go a little bit heavier? Am I going to go a little bit faster? Do I want to change this one up a little bit? Especially those doing it at home. Don't necessarily have the same tools that we have in here. Mm-hmm. Finding ways to modify and, and modify even better. Mm-hmm. In itself, the program is an educational opportunity. Not just for trainers. For for Who's movers, doing for it? human beings. Right. Who's doing it? Learning how you can move your body. And in something that may have been really difficult month one, how does it feel in month three? You're like, well, this is a piece of cake. Happened in three months? That's evolution, baby. It's right. happening right now, right, right in your very eyes. And that does fit these, the physiological process of when we plateau, which is typically a 10 to 12 week period. And then you get time to reflect and feel like you're just, you're on top of the world in a mm-hmm. sense. It's feeding your vitality of going like, I know this shit. Mm-hmm. Like when you, when you come into a workout and you're like, I know this and this is my, this is my shit. It's just energizing. Mm-hmm. You come into a workout and you're going, I hate these, I hate these, I hate these, I hate these. And you do them anyways. How many times do you hate before you're like just dwindled down? You're like, I don't, I need to do something different. I got to switch it up a little bit. Nothing wrong with that. It's just body communicating. Like I got to switch something up. But if you bring in enough variety that allows you to work at a sub-maximal level consistently, I'd rather have a sub-optimal program that I can do every single day than an optimal program that I can only do for three weeks. And I'm like, damn, I'm just, now I'm not optimized. Yeah, right. now I'm beat up. Is mm-hmm. that actual optimal program. And so, like I said, there's, there, if you focus too much on the numbers of things and you're serving a big population, not everybody's going to relate to that and, and grow with you on that because we're looking at growth as kind of like this linear line of what weights or what, how fast you're doing. It's rate, duration, load. Mm-hmm. Let's look at those other observational essentials of, of your positions and your drivers and your actions and your triangulations and what, hopefully your sphere starts lighting up. And if everybody has a little bit different experience, for me, it's like a visual, like I actually see this giant sphere around me and where when I'm sick, it's kind of closed down a little bit. Like I need to kind of like reach out and spread my bubble around a little bit and Mm. and open it up. Yep. Uh, And I, I I truly feel that with this sustainable vitality program, every single person that goes through it is going to find benefit and something that they can do over time, long periods. And so what we're hoping for is with this three year program that people start implementing is, wow, I don't have to do any programming. I just have to show up and coach this thing and help people evolve in their body. Yeah. What would be my three-year program? So we have, uh, you know, two years ago started this actual, we've been already doing it since we we started. Before I was here. We've been doing this format fifteen years. 15 years. Yeah. And I came in nine years ago, just over nine years ago. Mm Mm-hmm. And it was kind of hodgepodge in the sense of G1 was his own program, G2 was his own program, G3 was his own program. Mm -hmm. And over the years, we've now built kind of this approach of G1, G2, and G3 are the same work, the same title, same exercise intent, but the actual exercises that are programmed in that workout are more complex as the numbers go up. So G1 is very simple. It might just be like a lunge or just a press or just a curl or just a swing. G2 level might be more of a lunge and swing and a step and press. And G3 might be a leap, swing, and press. Mm -hmm. So there's multiple pieces to it. Mm -hmm. In this three-year program, G1, G2, and G3 are this continuum for quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, quarter four of year one, and then a new quarter one, two, three, and four of year two, and a new quarter one, two, three, and four of year three. But in that three-year series you've now gone through so many three-dimensional movements and integrations of other methodologies where we've extrapolated the principles and turned them into our gymnosified techniques Mm -hmm. with the tools that we have, especially with the Vipers and the steel maces and the landmines and the fit fighters and the power blocks. Like those are our, those are our main units that we use. And uh, this three year cycle essentially has an intent for every quarter. When you look at it, you go like, wow, this, this feels like the stages of development. Like as a, as a baby, what's the first thing you're doing? You know, you're moving the head around, your eyes around, you start to build some strength in your neck and then it starts to turn into the torso and you start to lift and look around and then you start to lift your body up and now you're in a seated position, you're rolling around and then you work your way into a squat into standing and into walking and into running. It very much feels like that. Now, quarter one is not all ground-based moving your head. Quarter two isn't all moving your thoracic spine. But in each quarter... You don't have to do them in order. They're all these 12 quarters, essentially, of program programs themselves. Each quarter can stand alone. Each day can stand alone. And you can just pick and choose exercises to do. And if you do them long enough, consistent enough, you're going to feel, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but this is just what people have said to me, is that you feel like evolved. You don't even know who you were three years ago. Hmm. I have one coach in particular, uh, Nick, who's 
gone through this program from the start. Shout out to you, Nick. Yeah, shout out, Nick, man. You've given me some, just r and this project. You've, you've given me some good uh, verbals and affirmations and things that have allowed me to tweak this workout, these, these programs. But essentially, there's an evolution that occurs because you're taking your, your mind and your body through a program that's not the traditional mindset of something that isn't sustained. I mean, ask yourself, how, how long have you been doing the workout series that you're currently doing? Oh man, some people say I've been doing this for ten years high potentially. School, right? so, yeah, and Maybe it's the same 50, thing. <laughs> you do the same thing. And like, man, I have you know, it kind of plateaued, but it's been, it has been sustainable. But how sustainable is it in the sense of is this going to keep feeding you, or right. you're like, man, I'm a ticking time bomb, and I'm going to change my change the way pretty soon. Right in the sport of life, right? But you can bring in those traditional exercises. We call them teddy bears for a lot of people. Like, I love my bench press. I love my back squats. Great. Yeah. Go, they're a great movement. Yeah. You know, people, people hate on them and stuff. And it's like, well, if you're looking at it just in the terms of going heavy and progressing that route, yeah, you, you can end up with some pretty heavy back stuff and, and like low back injuries and knee stuff and shoulder stuff. And it's just going to happen because you're grinding in a certain direction of movement when your body's designed to move multidimensionally. You go through this whole three years, it's, it's as if your spirit expanded mm-hmm. and you go, I have, I, I could just go, go show up somewhere and do something and I feel confident with what I'm doing, right? The, the goal is let's get a little sweat. Let's get the heart rate up. Let's feel the muscles working and let's feel like we engaged with our body in a conversation and we were present with it versus yeah. just, it was something to check off the list and move on. Nothing wrong with that. But if you're doing that for long periods of time, just checking the box, are you actually feeding the physicality of your life? Or are you just checking a box to clear your mental state of like, yeah, I got my workout in? Yeah, and I, I want people to kind of think about like, there is there is a simple workout that, that I've, I mean, I think of it myself 20 years, 20 years ago as a trainer, prog- pro- providing movement patterns for people was great. And it really isn't, going back to what you said, you know, bench pressures are great, back squats are great, cleans are great, deadlifts are great. But the body's more complicated than that. And life's more complicated than that. So if we can help understand the complexities, drill it down to its principles, what I mean by that is it's basic undeniable truths, and put that into techniques, aka exercises, and put it through a progression of time where people can digest it, feel it, progr- uh, see, not to say that we're similar again, um, but and kind of em- embody that ethos of change, what have we given them? We've given them a massive gift. We've given them movement. But mm-hmm. not movement for movement's sake. Movement for the enjoyment. And again, use the word vitality. And you just go Google what vitality means. That's a gift. And when that gift is taken from you, oh, if you haven't felt that yet, you're probably, a little, you're probably not old enough yet, but it is not a good feeling. And I cannot think of some... Well, there's a lot of things worse than that. But personally, if you just think about yourself in your own little bubble, you take away movement... That's tough. That is very, very tough. Yeah, it's like when you're in you know, short term, it's like when you're sick and you're like, oh no, this is, I'm, I'm dropping out of my program. I'm going to be out for two weeks. My endurance is going to be shot. I'm going to lose strength. You know, there's a lot of these things that happen mentally. Um, and when you're sick, it's one thing. When you're injured, it's another thing too. And if you're stuck on a certain way of moving and this is how you train and that's the rule and now you're hurt and you can't do that, I hear a lot of people don't do anything. Mm-hmm. And it's just rest, recover, and wait. There. You, that's, that'll, that'll help you. You'll probably recover and decrease some of the inflammation and it's going to take you some time and you're going to have to work your way back. But if you have a program that allows, at least an awareness, not even a program, just an awareness of how your body can move. And we talk about the eight, eight actions of lunging, squatting, pushing, pulling, reaching, locomoting, jumping, locomoting, vertimoting. I think that was all of them that I listed. For the, for the Anyways, yeah. yeah, those, those eight movement patterns. Well, okay, when you got an ankle injury, what do you go do? What are you able to do? You're able to still move through planes of motion and do some certain things. You might be able to, not be able to load it up like you once did, but if you can still get the movement piece and feed your body those movement nutrients, you're going to come out, maybe, sh- sure, when you get out of the injury, not as much endurance, not as much strength as you had, but you've now set yourself on a trajectory to just keep going and to, to feed that energy source within you through your movement. Mm-hmm. When we stop moving, we start dying. A lot, right. a lot faster. Right. right, we're all going towards the towards the end. But how are we approaching the end? Are we yeah. sprinting to it? Like let's just keep going until I die out? Or are we saying, like I want to truly bring in my best effort, my best energy into every single day of my life? We got to check in with ourselves and go. 
Today it's not maximal day. I don't want to necessarily load up the whole stack. Maybe one of those days you do need to because you're just like, it's been too long and I haven't put weight on. Now I need to kind of push myself and get out of that comfort zone. Mm -hmm. But it's this constant gauge of, of ability, of capacity, of availability. And some days you're going to wake up and something just feels off. Can you still move that day? Sure. Is it going to feel great? Maybe, maybe not. But I guarantee that if you go through some kind of movement, you're going to feel better about your day, better about your programming, better about your body. Just going through some form of movement. The hardest part is getting started with it. And I, it's really fun watching people come in here for the first time and they see the workout. And they're like, this is a, looks like a piece of cake. I'm going to crush this thing. And they go through the workout like, that was a lot harder than I thought because it was something different. Their body has, hasn't been exposed to that kind of movement yeah. more intentionally with some submaximal loads. Yeah. And I really do push people to work at a submaximal level as often as they can, but have some mixed in, like push a little bit more weight. Mm -hmm. What kind of reps can you get in a minute of this one? And start to gauge your true capacity because I think a lot of us hold back because of safety and fear of injury and just fear of what's going to happen if I push too hard or even fear, feel a fear of failure, trying something a little bit harder and not being able to do it. But with this program, it's designed to inch you closer to a higher capacity, inch you higher to more ability, inch you higher to more availability. That doesn't happen in six to 12 weeks. I wish it did. Gosh. It happens over years and right. years and years. We've got people who've been here for longer than I have. People have been here for, since the beginning of gymnasio, before it was gymnasio. Mm -hmm. And they're still doing it. And they're still showing up three to five days a week. Right. And you ask them how their life is. And they would say, I, I, they, I don't think they would be able to put words to it. They can just put feelings to it. And again, that, that's tough in our matrix. And our matrix size. I think that's the word I want to <laughs> say here. But um, anyways, of how much stronger did you get? What's your two two twenty five max? <laughs> you know, what, what's your age? You yeah. What, what, how many reps can you do of two twenty five yeah. on the bench? It's just like no, we don't. Uh, it's something we don't care. That's what we, what we focus on. So, it, in closing, where is this going? You know, I mean, you you are the director of research and development. You've had a cool a lot of cool cool titles. I think this is the cool, <laughs> coolest one. You know, where's this going? Well, I hope that more people attempt this program. Like it's going to be more available to be, we've had an R and D crew with our development the past few years when we launch this next year, getting people to just go through these movements and especially trainers trying something a little bit different, maybe using a different tool that they're not familiar with. Mm -hmm. uh, and not in super complex ways. It's just ways to expose your body to do a little more asymmetry and see how your body can communicate in space. What I hope for is that when people start doing some of these programs, they recognize how much comes from that exercise set, from that one exercise, from that one day of exercises, from that whole week. And when you do this program consistently for a whole month, do it again and do it again. And just get, offer yourself, give yourself one quarter of trying this sustainable vitality program and see what happens. Because it's going to be a, it's a lot more than just the, I, I bumped up 10 pounds on my bench on my deadlift, those things will increase too. They will. But what do you experience mentally, physically, and emotionally through going through this program? Because it is, it's so hard to put into words. You know, it, I understand people here in this, it's, I have a visual of actual my template and the framework that goes into before I actually put the first exercise into the template. You know, I have a lot of the multi-dimensions of what I want somebody to experience physically, what they want them to experience emotionally. And not to say this is what they're going to experience, but this sets them up, sets them up for a somatic map of their movement. Mm -hmm. And they really have this internal communication that it's a, it's a level of confidence it goes up tremendously. And for trainers, I think that's happens. It'll happen almost immediately. Cause you're like, wow, this, I see benefit. I see, something that's powerful within this exercise. I'm going to implement it in my workout of the day today. What happens when you start putting more of those into your workout of the day? What happens when that becomes a majority of your movement focus? Mm -hmm. You still might have your heavy performance sets that you want to do with the trad traditional stuff. But when you start dripping in this three-dimensional and multiple methodology approach, it's... ah. I can't even put into words the, the uh, amount of connection that you're able to experience because you, you're taking your body through something physically that isn't restricted by the rules and it's opened up to the potential of what life can give you. It's so much more than a fitness program. Mm -hmm. It is fitness. So you're definitely going to get some work in there. Yep. Uh, but it's set up in a way to 
help you engage with the universe in a more powerful way. Um, and with each other too, you got, you go through something that's kind of awkward and funky with somebody else that also went through it. You start to talk, have a conversation about it. Right. Uh, and that conversation happens externally and internally. Right. Communication between clients, building a community of people that feel something that's like when, tough to put in words. When somebody comes in and go, Oh my gosh, I was on a hike the other day. You're not going to, you're not going to believe this. I did a gymnasium move. It's like, it's so funny. It's, it's that's a life a, movie. That's we a just do a we gymnasium. Yeah, it's it a happens, that happens every day yeah. in some way, shape or form. <laughs> Uh, and it's, it's lifestyle stuff. It's mm-hmm. not necessarily like I, you know, I took five minutes off a trail run. That's a different set of programming that we have too, more one-on-one based, but something that's on a, on the, the general training in our G1, G2, G3 is it's this, it's an overarching theme of just this pulsation that your body creates. It's mm-hmm. like when you go through it, you start to invite more things in your life that open up potential. It's not like you get stuck in this one path, this one journey, your journey is expanded to, wow, there's a lot of different routes I can go. And having a coach is very helpful in that so you don't get stuck in stagnation and go, right. I don't know where to go now. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, let's, let's bring some intent to it. What do you want to get better at? I don't know. Uh, what, do you, what do you want to do? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, what's, what, what's, hard, what's hard in your yeah. life? Mm-hmm. What's tough in your life? Ah, putting deodorant on across my body. Okay, so we're talking about some pain, some discomforts. Mm-hmm. Let's create a program that helps expose areas that your body hasn't been moving through. Maybe the pain is because you have not ventured outside your norm. Maybe the pain is because you've gone too hard or too consistent in one path of motion or one style of programming. Uh, let's see what happens in a, in, in, a, in a session. How do you feel? Energized, open, free, uh, worked, taxed. You know, there's a lot of different uh, adjectives you can bring into this of feeling, but it's primarily about the intent with which you come in to explore that exercise set. And if your intent is to just kick your own ass, you're going to kick your own ass. If your intent is to, I just want to learn about my body, take it a little bit slower, you're going to learn about right, your body. body right. This These workouts allow a lot of opportunities to set different intentions as a coach with a crew or as each individual within that crew. And it's it's up to the coach to kind of set that stage uh, of development. Yeah. I'm going to try to put a cap on this. It's going to be tough. I'm going to do my best succinctly here because um, <clears throat> honestly, CJ, I could it's uh, to, to put words into movement is tough. It's like putting words into, into flavor and to taste. <laughs> I've, I've mm-hmm. been to Napa Valley a few times for those uh, West, West coasters. That's kind of like uh, kind of, uh, we, we would call it here from the uh, central coast, old school wine region. And they used words to try to describe the flavor of wine. And uh, I've read on, on a menu, freshly opened tennis ball case, you know, <laughs> freshly cut garden hose, <laughs> like <God>. graphite, <laughs> you know, graphite and sage and black pepper, you know, they're trying to describe a flavor of wine. We're trying to describe the, f- the, the feeling of movement. And, uh, we have to use a lot of, um, analogies and different ways of feeling, of feeling it. What we've, what we're doing, and I want to be very, very clear what we're doing. Our passion, our mission is to share, to open source in a sense, how we feel and we've been taught the human body is capable of moving. You and I both come the, from the traditional movement sector. That's how we trained ourselves. That's how I got into fitness. And we still don't avoid that. We just do it less often because it's a piece of the puzzle. There's a, it's like this jigsaw puzzle has been put before us and we have to say, hey, put it together. And so I feel like we've got the, the borders of that jigsaw puzzle down. I, you know, to be honest with you, I have to have some sort of pride in what we're doing, right? And we're trying to fill it in to see this biggest picture. Now, will we ever truly fill it in? I don't think so. But we're going to get real. I'm, we're going to die trying. I really mean that. <laughs> we will die trying. And we want to pass this on to other trainers who have this same feeling that there's a gap. You know, Gary Gray would say there's this gaposis. You know, what's that mean? There's that, we're, that there's a condition of not fully understanding the full story. And we believe from, relatively speaking, to see, say it as simply as possible, from the baby boomer to that teenager who wants to do this program, they can fit into this. Now, we all have movement dysfunctions and problems, and this is a group training, right? This is a, this is a group mentality. So are we here to fix significant acute movement patterns? No, this is not. Will it help? It very well could. But it's, not, its intention is to take someone from a relatively health neutral to a health positive maybe even a health slightly negative. It kind of depends on how we look at it. And we're trying to share this, and so other trainers can see something that it's taken us decades to see. And so they can experience it, and they can put it out there. Um, it's some, this is a, a program that you can, it, you can t- 
take home yourself and actually do it. It's going to be on the market. And it actually currently is an, on the market in certain stages. We're not done with it yet. We still have, uh, gosh, three more quarters until it's uh, that three-year set. And why three years? We feel that's a complete process. Is, are you going to stop programming and revamping this thing? Nope. It's kind of like whenever you buy an Apple computer, you just buy it at the best technology that they have. And you, when you buy the next one, when that technology is not good enough, you buy it. So that's what's how it's going to happen here. We're going to keep ev evolving this. But that three-year picture we feel like, you feel, really is a good picture of that jigsaw puzzle. And uh, we're just going to keep dwindling in more and more and more. Um, final, final words, thoughts. Got to have a physical practice. You got to do it. You know, we talk about the flavors. You, you can't actually taste the wine by talking about the wine. You can't actually feel the workout by just looking at the workout. Mm. You might be able to anticipate yep. from the smell of the wine, right? Yeah. What it's going to taste like. You might be able to anticipate the workout by the look of the set. But when you actually go through it, that's the truth. You got to physically experience it and explore it yourself. And I know you, you said something about, you know, we're going to keep evolving this program and it's never the full picture. The cool thing about this program is it provides opportunities to fill in your own jigsaw puzzle. It's not like this is the gymnasium puzzle and this is it. It's like, here's a framework in which you can start to implement with your own tools, with your own community, and depending on what your community likes to do. You know, as we're a very active community, outdoorsy group here, it might be a little different living in the Midwest during the wintertime. And how do you talk to and experience, uh, explore a workout that serves your community? You got to go through it. You got to physically experience it. So, mm -hmm. with anything, not even just this, but with anything, you can't knock it until you try it. It's it's just a judgment internally until you actually experience it. And certainly from the outside, this looks like easy, easy stuff until you start moving through it and you go, "Wow, I didn't realize my body couldn't quite do what I thought it could do," or "Holy shit, that looked like it was really hard and complex, but I just did it." I just did that flow set of four different exercises in one, and I've never done that before. Mm. Physically experience it, and as a coach, start to implement it and see how your community goes through it. And you're going to learn a whole bunch along the way as well. You know, I've programmed certainly a lot of things that I'm like, we got to change that. <laughs> of course, <laughs> that was not right for the yeah. right person. Yeah. That was a good program, but not for the not for who we who we put it out mm -hmm. there for. Um, so make adjustments and and modify, but please explore and modify for yourself. Yeah. Yeah, and my final word is I remember being, again, starting as a trainer and it was a chore to program for that person. I would do it moments before they even showed up for the, for the workout. Sorry to say it for those clients who are <laughs> still listening <laughs> to that. You know? And to be able to have that sense of, again, we want trainers to have a sustainable career. Oh, we use that word again. Successful, sustainable, vital career. How can we help in that process? What have we figured out that we just want to pass on? And you said it so, so greatly. We're standing on the shoulders of giants have helped us get to where we are what's our job to allow people to stand on our shoulders and that's it's their choice but what can we give what, what can we pass on because we believe uh, well we don't believe we live a way that fitness can truly evolve to and that's what we're here to do so i hope you got some good value out of this podcast um man we, uh, i want to put a to be continued on, on this topic it's definitely to be continued <laughs> um, and for those of you listening, please provide comments. Uh, what do you want to hear more about? If there's a, a certain thing that CJ said, you say, gosh, please dive into that. You know, please give us another 45 minutes, an hour on that topic. We would love to. Uh, we sit at this table, um, A, because we love it, B, because um, we want to share it. But uh, I think C, just because it's fun, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a passion of ours. So thank you very much. Appreciate you being here. And CJ, thanks for your time. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.